Yo, Shortbox Nation, this is Botter, and I'm here to tell you right now that con season starts early this year with the return of Northeast Florida's premier anime, comic book, and sci-fi event, Collective Con. That's right, Northeast Florida's largest pop culture convention returns for its 10th year on March 8th through the 10th at the Prime Osborne Center in Jacksonville, Florida. 10 years of Collective Con, they're pulling all the stops out to make sure this is a can't-miss event. And the guest list they got going, don't even get me started on the guest list. I mean, they've got A-list celebrity guests and voice actors from some of your favorite movies, anime, and video games like Elijah Wood and Sean Ashton, Ray Park, Trisha Helfer, Ross Marquin, Max Middleman, and bo herself would be there, Katie Sackhoff. Tell me what other convention is giving you the opportunity to meet Frodo and Sam from Lord of the Rings, Darth Maul, and One Punch Man all under the same roof. Only at Collective Con. And if you're looking to get some of your favorite comics signed, or if you want to get an original sketch from some of the best comic artists in the world, well, you're in luck because there'll be plenty of comic and creator guests there, like DC comic artist extraordinaire Clay Mann, Harvey Award nominated illustrator John Taylor Christopher, Marvel and DC cover artist Chris Stevens, and acclaimed Star Wars author Timothy Zahn. They'll all be at Collective Con this year. And if you're looking to bring the family or if you want to make a weekend out of it, you're in luck because there'll be so much going on at CollectiveCon that weekend in the form of vendors, fan panels, video game tournaments, cosplay contests, after parties, and a bunch of fan events. You can purchase single and three-day weekend passes now using the link in this episode's show notes or by going to CollectiveCon.com to book your tickets and hotel. Buy your tickets now, and I'll see you at CollectiveCon, March 8th through the 10th. Now let's start the show. Ladies and gentlemen. I present to you the short box. Yo, Short Box Nation, welcome to episode 286. I'm your host, Botter Milligan, and my normal crew of co-hosts, including Cesar, Ed, and Ashley, are doing fine, and we'll be back on the mic soon. For today's episode, I've enlisted the help of a familiar voice and alumni to the Short Box podcast, my favorite friend of me, the Gary Oak to my Ash Ketchum. I'm, of course, talking about Mr. Ryan Paul Thompson, the founder of the video game culture and charity company GAM, Game Arts and Music. It's been almost a year since the last time I had him on the show, uh, but he's on the Short Box hotline today to talk about how he's been navigating the GAM company in these confusing times and share his thoughts on the latest headlines coming out of the video game industry. But before we jump in and hear from Ryan, I want to give a shout out to the Short Box patrons that helped us make last week's episode possible. A big Short Box thank you to Amanda Marin, Darby Herbin, Blythe Brumley, Joshua Pickett, Tony Aopi, and Tom Pandich. You can listen to us chat about the various comics, video games, projects, and books that have been keeping them busy during quarantine on our previous episode, 285, Short Box hotline on your favorite podcast app now and last but not least a big shout out to tyler mangus aka townie wilbur art a florida-based cartoonist who was a fan of the show and reached out earlier this week with kind words and encouragement for the podcast and the crew thanks for being a part of the short boss nation tyler okay my shout outs have been shouted and the proper respect for our spectacular short box nation given i'm ready to introduce my guest co-host today short box nation let's give a round of applause and sprinkle in a couple of boos for ryan paul thompson aka the gam father thanks for joining the show today ryan I better get a of that. that's what i'm talking about <laughs> boo yourselves like i care dude <laughs> it's been a year since i had you on the show i mean last time on the show Man, I was going on that whole Alec Baldwin trip for a while. I was like the man <laughs> of repeat performances. Man. I guess y'all banned me after that. I yeah, uh, I think finally my threat of not having you on the show like came came to fruition. Almost a year, man, uh, and it was about the E3. Yeah, I had called you. We talked about E3. That's back when we, we still had E3 back then. Those were the good old days. Man, ain't it crazy to like, be able to say a phrase like that? Oh, you mean that one year that we had E3? <laughs> <laughs> and E three is definitely canceled. Like they're not doing like a um a, a re you know reschedule or anything like that. Like it's it's done for the year, correct? Oh yeah, for the year it's it's done. Um, they've already scheduled for next year. Mm-hmm. Although at this point, I'm sure it'll be such a radically different E three. It'll be much more consumer friendly at this point. They're already going through enough crap. Do you before think before the whole COVID hit? Do, ahead, you, do you think there's any like negative or maybe even a positive impact to like the video game industry or, or just kind of community at large of E3 uh, w- with them skipping E3 this year? 
Uh, it's for the consumer. Mm-hmm. I think yes. Uh, it's going to force. Well, I mean, that's one of the main reasons why it was in trouble before COVID even got announced. You know, other companies were kind of wary of what's the, the consumer impact on E3. And I'll say kind of like the social universe was like, hey, why isn't E3 doing this, this, and this for, for consumers? And uh, I think at this point, it, with it being skipped, it's like, okay, well, now when we come back, the perception is this needs to be much more of a consumer-friendly event. I mean, that was one of the reasons why I think Jeff Keighley, you know, he was one of the main guys. He does the video game awards. Um, super cool guy. You know, he pulled out of working with E3, and he was responsible for actually a lot of the the industry programming. Hmm. Uh, he did like the the Coliseum or something like that, uh, which is one of the reasons why we didn't use the word Coliseum for Game Gladiators. Hmm. <laughs> but uh, you know, he wanted a lot of changes, wasn't happy, and you could see the some of like the direction that he would like to go in, in the video game awards. Like you're seeing commercials and promotions and trailers for new products and announcements and all that kinds of stuff during the video game awards that would probably be very similar to the direction that E3 needs to go in if it's going to be more consumer focused Mm -hmm. but um you know it just it sucks overall like everybody's like oh you know it's something cool that we're all passionate about but it'll it'll have to improve or die at this point because after this big of a, a gap and expectations rising and plus now video game studios because of not because of corona but you know as soon as e3 was having problems even before so a lot of these companies and consumers as well were saying hey why don't these companies just do their own kind of nintendo directs do their own videos or do their own like promotional launches of their products so it's created more of a focus on that Mm -hmm. Companies are going to do more of their own thing. Um, and we'll quickly see who's good at it and who's not. Like, I think the whole Doom Animal Crossing thing was a great example of video game companies being able to promote their own and mm-hmm. other kind of products. I don't know if you're... Did you play Doom or Animal Crossing? I know you're playing, like, PlayStation 2 stuff right now. <laughs> no, but <laughs> I, I cannot begin to tell you how many... Um, Folks on my various social medias have referenced Animal Crossing, and I mean this is coming from like um, individuals that I would not call like you know regular gamers. So for yeah. me, it's like, damn, what's going on with the, like this Animal Crossing that everyone's fucking playing it? Animal Crossing has benefited from COVID more than probably any other game on the planet. And, and why, like, why? Like, what specifically? How are they? Uh, I mean, was it like a, a, a campaign, a marketing strategy? I mean, wh- why do you think they're they're um, doing so well in this um, kind of environment? I mean, the marketing was great already. Like, in terms of, like, it's, like, not just its collaboration with Doom, uh, but it's got its own heritage and legacy. It was already, like, a, a game to watch. People already have a lot of passion behind that brand. But with the whole premise of this game being just like this huge kind of time sink of like, this isn't, you know, um, I'm doing speed runs or I got to beat 87 bosses. This is the game where, Hey, I'm just going to chill for an afternoon. I got nothing to do. I'm just going to go farm a little bit on animal crossing, go buy some stuff, maybe visit my friends. Mm -hmm. This is like that game. Like when you were in, in school, like during summer vacation, you're like, man, I'm just going to play this for like a few weeks and yeah. do nothing else. That's what Animal Crossing was or is. And then like now you're in this situation where everyone's like, yo, I'm just going to sit here and chill. And I want to forget about all the horrible things going on in the world. Oh, I still want to see my friends. You can come on over to my island. So I can't see you in real life. You know, so. <laughs> and, and, and I think that is what I've seen the most of, or at least like the, the, the aspect of Animal Crossing I've seen the most of being promoted from friends is the um, the social aspect of like, oh, me and mm-hmm. so-and-so are hanging out on Animal Crossing today fishing, you know? Yeah. It's, it's really weird, and it's really... It's an interesting observation on behavior and how we're changing a society. The things like with Animal Crossing or even... Um, like the Travis Scott concert 
uh, oh, Fortnite. Fortnite too. That was Which, oh my god, that was sick. Oh, that I, was so amazing. What was what was the um? And I mean, I I I I just saw like only a couple headlines, but it was you know something to the effect of like six million users all on at once for that, or it was just some record breaking number that I could not wrap my head around. It was cr- okay. So you haven't seen it? I've I've seen uh like two or three videos uh, on, posted on Twitter, and it was like holy okay. shit, they actually threw a concert in this yeah. video game. And I've been to a Travis Scott concert when he came to Jax, and it looked pretty fucking similar. Like I was like, oh, they literally <laughs> took awesome. his stage and put it in Fortnite. Well, think of it was just I think it was a huge jump forward in terms of not like from a technological standpoint. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, you and I play enough games. Like, see Travis Scott and Fortnite. Like, yeah, man, I remember this shit when it was called Shadow of the Colossus. That's all right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. it, but it was just visually so appealing. Mm-hmm. And, like, you had this whole video, audio thing completely. You were immersed in it. Yeah. It was kind of unexpected, like, because you didn't know what to expect from it. So, I, you know, when you're being, oh, I'm underwater, and now I'm flying through stuff. I'm yeah, all yeah, these yeah. That's what I saw. Like, but I they feel- have successfully done what every company is trying to achieve right now in terms of going digital and virtual. Mm -hmm. And they made an experience that's typically a real world experience, exciting and engaging and something where you can still connect with other people based upon an experience in real time, which Everybody else is trying to figure that out. Like, how do I make shopping mm-hmm. real time? How do I sell my, like, we're all like, okay, I'll do curbside or do pickup to go and this and that. But this is something else where it's like, hey, this whole experience is digital. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole, everybody wants to go to like a con or a party or a movie theater. Here you had an event where you had over, you had millions of people at the same time all experiencing something. And you saw it trending on Twitter. You saw people talking about faith. Like, people were still connected over this. That's, Again, the more they do this, the less impressive it'll be. Mm-hmm. Or I'd have to figure out new stuff to do to make it. And you know, it's, as... it's not like they couldn't have done this before, but mm-hmm. with, with the current you know uh, situation, everyone kind of having to stay at home um, mm-hmm. to see the the um, engagement. I, I wonder, I wonder if it would have even you know been a, a, a quarter of that engagement had it you know been just a normal um, kind of you know day to day. Well, I remember when they did it, they did one before with uh, Marshmallow. Mm-hmm. And it was still like, it was a really big event. Um, I want to say they still had like, I can't say with certainty, but I I remember it trending huge. And I want to say it was in the millions still. Um, I'm looking it up now. Uh, 10.7 million players showing up. But I, I, that was just huge. I don't know how many times it was viewed on YouTube or mm. Twitch and all that. So I think even outside of this thing going on, the pandemic, it still would have been huge. But I, I think you're right. It's definitely become much bigger because of the pandemic. I'm just surprised that none of the servers crashed. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, damn, man, our workplace probably handled 10 people You know, as, <laughs> without Zoom crashing. As a fan of... Um... Of, of you know of, of hip hop and how and I, I stay up to date with all the industry stuff and then like kind of where it's going especially in this digital age, um, mm-hmm. seeing Fortnite or you know r- rappers like Travis Scott and, and Drake being so involved with things like Twitch and Fortnite and and plenty of other um, uh, hip hop acts have gotten into the whole Twitch um, mm-hmm. thing as well. Um, that marriage of like two of my favorite you know th- you know hip hop and fucking video games. Um, mm-hmm. It, it, man, it, it just shows like that. Like Death Jam Five for New Dude, York, which, by what? the way, is a crazy expensive game to find. Like uh, them old <laughs> freaking Death Jam games. Oh my god! And I think it has to do with like the licensing. Like, it, yeah, because that's time. not on PS Now, is it? I don't know, but I might have to check. I, don't, I, don't, I can't imagine that it is because I think you're right. Licensing just for the music alone would be a nightmare. Yeah, and and I think that's probably one of the earliest examples of. Um, of hip hop and video games, um, um, like uh, crossing over in the success, but then you also see it as an example of, well, the music industry as a general has always had a lot of issues with things like royalties and payments or anything really involving financials, and 
Um, Bro, I can't even live stream without getting flagged for music stuff. <laughs> the music industry needs to get their shit together. Yeah. Like, I just... Yo, this is Botter. Sorry for interrupting this episode, but I'll keep it brief. I wanted to let you know about a massive sale we have going on over at the Shortbox store on all of our merchandise and apparel. That's theshortboxstore.bigcartel.com. You can now save 20% off your entire order using the discount code YO, Y-O-O. So if you've been waiting for the right time to finally buy that gauntlet snapback, or if you ever wanted to buy any of the shirts you see me wear on the podcast, well, now's your chance to get them for a steal. We still have a few sizes left of everything, but they won't last long and once they're gone they are gone and then i mentioned that all of our apparel is screen printed on high quality material none of that heat transfer or direct to garment stuff our shirts are some of the most comfortable ones you'll ever wear and the hats look even better in person so wear your support for the short box nation proudly knowing that you're going to look damn good doing it get to the shortboxstore.bigcartel.com as soon as you can and don't forget to use that discount code Yo, Y-O-O, to save 20% off your entire order. All of this information can be found in this episode's show notes if you want to get there faster. Thanks for not pressing fast forward. Now back to the show. But, I mean, to, to see, like, the success of that Travis Scott Astro Night, uh, Astro, I'm sorry, uh, Travis Scott and uh, Fortnite oh. event, it just makes like a logical sense of the next evolution of, of hip hop and in this digital space. Cause at first, you know, I, I remember oh, yeah. when things like Spotify first dropped and whatnot, and it was just like, Whoa, I can stream every, any album and it's legal now to see it, like take mm-hmm. the jump to video games and see that collaboration between like these two different brands. It's, it's, it's really definitely inspiring and whatnot. Um, it's, it's amazing. And, but I don't think a lot of people are realizing is that Epic has technically just become the NFL and has become the Super Bowl. Because what they'll look at now is what are the numbers for Travis Scott, mm. in, ter- Travis Scott in terms of kind digital of sales, yeah. live streams, all that kinds of stuff after this versus before. Yeah. Because if you have like over 10, 15 million people watching, listening to your music, especially for a launch. Yeah. You know that you know people are buying stuff on Apple and Spotify and Google Play and all that kinds of stuff. That's what the Super Bowl does. The Super Bowl sells that space. Like if hey, the Black Eyed Peas or Beyonce or whoever yeah, yeah. is going to show up on the Super Bowl, they pay the Super Bowl for that spot mm-hmm. because people will watch and listen, and then they get the sales from that. The Super Bowl doesn't pay them to show up. You pay the Super Bowl. You pay the NFL. So what do you do now in your epic? And you've created this scenario where it's like, yo, if you come do one of our Fortnite events, and this is a special event, it's only X amount of times a year, here's how many views and listens you're going to get. This is what it's worth. You're now going to pay us to develop this and be in the game. It's like what they've done with the dancing stuff. They're not paying anybody. They won that lawsuit. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, the, the, the Fortnite uh, dances that... So you're saying Fortnite ended up coming... Because uh, I, I didn't follow up with it to the end i thought it was still ongoing so you're saying fortnite won that lawsuit i remember carlton lost his and i think donald i think Hmm. i'm not 100 percent sure i think donald Faison lost his case damn Hmm. i know carlton lost his because of the whole thing where his moves were based off of other people's dance moves too man but uh like and don't get me wrong i'm sure epic paid travis scott to do this there's there's but uh if this is how it maintains two years from now three years from now i'd fucking flip the script and be like yo you know disney you got this new hannah montana looking star coming out you want this to be in fortnite this is what it's gonna cost so you're telling fortnite just to continue to sell out baby come on sell out yep um speaking about uh you know companies adapting and kind of coming up with uh innovative ways to engage their audiences during uh this pandemic and people you know staying home um how is gam doing man i want to i want to hear about about our our hometown organization man how is how's game arts and music how's the gam fam how's everything well butter in these times <laughs> gam is taking the stance <laughs> nah i was playing we're fucked <laughs> <laughs> I was say, what political answer is this <laughs> no i mean we, I- we're doing what we can to be honest and you know 
Well, you know me personally. I've I've been involved in like digital and tech and all Dude, that. For every a, time I open up my, my Facebook, for a while. Every time I open up Facebook, especially like recently, you know, in the last month or two, I am not surprised when I see, "Hey, Gam is live. Would you like to view the video?" I will give you props that you have. One, to your point, you've always been involved in the, the digital space. I think you've always looked at technology and, and, and asked yourself, how can I incorporate the latest and greatest technology into GAM and, and to uh, reach our audience and expand the GAM fam? Um, it's really been really impressive to see you double down on that and where a lot of um, you know local um, uh, event spaces and whatnot um, are now playing catch up. What you're doing is just really leaning in extra hard into what you've already kind of helped establish. So it's been impressive to see you like stay consistent with a more recurring um, live stream, um, whether it's you just playing Mujin, which uh, we got to talk about Mujin, <laughs> whether it's just been you <laughs> playing Mujin or hopping on for just like quick GAM updates or just hopping on just to talk with like other individuals in the, uh, um, the GAM family or whatnot. It's been impressive to see you like really just uh, running with what you've um, helped establish with GAM. No, thank you. I appreciate you sucking up on that. That's really not no. <laughs> so what? What do you Damn um? Silence. So what do you think about? I mean, for anyone listening, and I mean your your relationship with the short box and Gam's relationship with the short box, and vice versa. I mean, it's definitely been long standing. So it shouldn't be no surprise that I think a lot of folks are looking forward to this year's um, um, Gam show, which you guys typically throw toward you know in the middle of the summer, if not towards the end. I guess let me just you know just be blatant and, and, and frank and ask: Are we getting a gam show this year? Honestly, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I really don't know. There's there's plans in place, and this kind of I'll wrap this in with with your last question a little bit. So we've been in digital, but now we're trying to. The obstacle now is like how, not how how can GAM be digital is how can we get the community to be digital mm. and experience things digitally. Kind of like what, you know, Renzo hit me up as soon as that Fortnite thing came out. I was like, this is dope. Here's how we need to do it at GAM. I need AR goggles and a desert. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> let me work on that. You're like, I got the desert. I just don't got the AR goggles. Yeah. <laughs> it's called the Prime Osborne Convention Center. That shit is empty. <laughs> That's a fine <laughs> but, uh, Jacksonville joke. That is a fine Jax joke. <laughs> this is why people don't work with me. but there's um the bigger obstacle is how do you get the community to transition at the same time and how do you enable and empower your team to be leaders and trailblazers with new tech new ways of thinking um potentially with a lot of potential failures in terms of what we're going to do, mm-hmm. you know, cause to, to jump into this kind of space and to change things this radically, you're going to fail a lot. And that's one of the reasons why you see me streaming so, so much. Like I, I crash and burn publicly <laughs> a lot. Like we tried, remember we tried to do the zoom thing with the people. Yeah. And oh my God. I got blasted. Like with people jumping on there with, you know, dropping N word, F bombs, putting porn videos up there. Damn. Like Claire had to bounce. She got scared. She's like, what is this? I'm leaving. And that was an experiment to see, hey, how do how can we do big group community videos? What are the dangers and the pitfalls there? And it's uncomfortable to to fail. It's uncomfortable to to be put in those scenarios that are so unfamiliar and that especially publicly, you're like, dang, I don't want I don't look like a dumbass in front of everybody. Yeah. Um, I'm fine with it. Like I'm very, I guess, entrepreneurial in that cult fail fast kind of mentality. Um, but it, you can't expect that of everybody that you work with and that's okay. But you also can't expect that of your audience and your customers. So do you, so do you think it's worth the risk of, trying these things and failing publicly like do you worry that'll impact like the the gams brand like do you think it's worth trying all these things seeing what sticks 
Or have you considered maybe taking a step, like some of these other um, kind of organizations, and not to compare you, you to any organization, but yeah, no, I've no, noticed no, other or, or, um, similar kind of event organizers or just people that, all, you know, companies that dabble in um, uh, conventions and just kind of uh, nerdy get-togethers, they're taking a step back. And instead of trying the digital route, they're just like, no, we're just going to reschedule for next year. I mean, do you think that is worth the risk of trying all these things? Or have you considered maybe just pausing uh, any game related events this year um, and we're seeing what, what happens in the next couple months? For, for GAM and for me, I think it's worth the risk. Hmm. If I was another event or in a different kind of type of organization, but like, you know, it might be better just to, to hold and wait it out because GAM's different for, I mean, and I make no, it's no secret you know, I have a day job. You know, if if GAM is going to go on pause for a year, two years, three years, I can still get by. Mm -hmm. That's that's fine. But that's not what GAM is about. Like, it's not about, hey, are we going to have record attendance next year? Or are we going to be able to do how many people are going to show up? Or what's our ticket sales going to be? Like, that's, those are all important. Like, those are goals. But the, the bigger thing is just what are we doing? Like, how are we connecting with people? You know, how are we expressing ourselves? Like, GAM is mostly artists. We're creative people. Mm -hmm. And you can't put a – you don't just say, okay, we're going to stop creating. We're going to stop being inspired. We're going to stop being motivated. We're going to stop expressing ourselves. Like, you can't stop that. So for GAM, it's – I look at it as, okay, this is just one of those times where we now have to transform and do something else. You know, like if you're an artist and like your hands break, you don't just stop making art. You're like, you're still thinking of ideas. Hell, you might start drawing with your toes. You might take up some kind of like thing. Like you figure out some other way to express yourself in that time or you become depressed. Hmm. And so with GAM, we're just like, okay, what other ways can we create? What other ways can we connect with people? If it was a different event, like if I was, I don't want to call out anybody's name or anything like that, but I will. No. <laughs> if I was another event. You're like, sure, Fox say, Entertainment event. Like, like one of the big conventions, like San Diego Comic Con, right? Yeah. I'm like, is it worth the one? That's a business. Tons of people are being employed. We got to do something to make money and whatnot. So. Their whole thing probably was, all right, we can't cancel until that whole act of nature thing steps in because we need insurance to take care of all of our cancellation shit and yeah. blah, blah, blah. He was like the venues that we got to pay back and maybe now we don't have to pay them. So all that kind of stuff is in play. And they're like, you know what? Is it worth us risking our brand to do this, this, and that? Mm -hmm. For them, probably not. They've got a big enough brand and they have a lot more to lose it's not part of their brand to change that quickly, you know? And you know, when I look at conventions of that size or just any, any type of gathering of that size, um, you know, really kind of holding out it, I think it puts a spotlight on the value of that in-person kind of interaction. Like, like they, they almost yeah. know, like, you know, this people look forward to the opportunity to be in this same you know gi giant uh, convention center with the same you know like minded people um you know meet their favorite yeah. artists and and whatnot like you can't put you can't replace that like there there's just something about physically being in that space and 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 being there in the moment that we cannot replace um and we are trying our damnedest to you know um, oh. um you know, b before we cancel, we want to make sure that, you know, there is no opportunity at all for us not to throw this event. Yeah. And I mean, that's where, can I answer your, your other question? You know, we've had to do that mm -hmm. here. Like we've had some events where we waited as long as we could until announcing a cancellation. And part of it's because we all want that connection. Mm -hmm. now, there, there is something like, yeah, it's, it's great when you're seeing each other online, but it's just, it isn't the same as being with somebody in real life. And there's something that's almost 
it's almost like a drug rush, like an adrenaline boost when all of your your friends or people that you don't even know that are into the same thing are together in the same space and you're experiencing these new things or you get to see a picture of a Spider-Man and you're all nostalgic because, oh, yeah, this was the time that J. Jonah Jameson actually have to look out for him. You know, there's there's something magical about that. And nobody wants to say no to that. I don't yeah. want to say no to that. You know, we all want it to happen. We want to experience those things. But this is just such a, a difficult, it's a difficult time. Everybody keeps on hoping that things are going to get better sooner than they probably will. Yeah. So we kind of set these false expectations for ourselves. That's when you start getting things where, like when, like when you're asking, are we going to have a game this year? I don't know. I still hope that we do. I still have contracts in place for hopefully that we do. Mm-hmm. I mean, GAM, GAM has been in – the first GAM was in December. Typically, we do it in the summer. Right now, we had it scheduled for, for late August. Um, even with things getting better, I I'm, mean, I'm, you know, I'll be flat out about it. I'm very skeptical about it happening in August. Like, I don't – where I am right now, I don't feel like things – I don't have enough information, but I don't feel like things are safe enough to put people in that risk. And I don't feel comfortable taking that risk. I'd rather do something else in the meantime, whether it's like some version of GAM where, hey, everybody has to stay six feet apart and here's your gloves <laughs> and your mask. Yeah. We do something digital. Quarantine con. Or, what's that? Sorry. I said quarantine con. Yeah, pretty- I'm not surprised. I got to check for that domain name. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, and that's like one of the reasons why we're trying to do the whole, the stay at home con thing is like, okay, we can't have an in-person deal. Let's try to organize something that people can still not just connect on, but a lot of the small businesses, they need, they don't have art markets anymore. They don't have opportunities to do pop-ups and things like that. So what can we do for our community? So those people can still go forward. And that's honest, man. And, and, and that's what I always appreciate about kind of talking to you is that because you've, you know, I, I do consider you an entrepreneur. I definitely consider you a, a professional, um, <clears throat> like, event coordinator. I mean, GAM has, has had a hell of a success. It's been interesting as hell to see its um, rise in popularity uh, as well as its um, um, kind of cementing its its role in the in the community. Um so w- when you talk, I, d- I definitely appreciate the honest insight from that perspective. And I'll say this about w- what you guys have got going on is that you guys have now, you know, not only leaned it more into the digital space and, and technology, but you guys have also leaned into what I think um, what I, one of the most important aspects of game is the, is the community. Because w- what I've noticed lately is that, you know, I think you've probably seen the same kind of memes or just jokes going around is... Um, this is the time to you know take a look at the, th- these companies and see their reaction or their response to the shutdowns and and what oh, yeah. and you know let's you know let's really pay attention to these companies and, and you know make sure that you know we take a note of which ones are taking care of the employee employees and and whatnot. But I also think that this has also put um, the consumers in a position to also be responsible because. Mm-hmm. Yes, a lot. The question is being asked of these uh, of these companies. You know, what are you doing to adapt? How are you still putting out your products? How are you still um, uh, uh, caring for your audience and and whatnot? But mm-hmm. I think it's it's also a, 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 the other side of the mirror is well, as a consumer, what are you doing to support you know these, especially like these lo- exactly. uh, especially these smaller brands or just uh, more independent it was probably a better term these independent brands that um that rely on uh the these social interactions and these social gatherings like how are you as a consumer and so-called fan showing your loyalty so it's like a two-way street man and it's been interesting to to see um both sides kind of step up or lack of stepping up to the plate but I, i will say with with gam you guys are a prime example of you put the people first, even in these t- hard times, I think that's this is where you see um, 
that um, investment in the community and in you know knowing the, the people, your audience, this is where you see that payback. So you know it's it's definitely a lesson for me, you know, as someone you know who runs kind of a a, a business as well to see the importance of always putting your customers first. You got a strong community too, man. Earning that like, oh, man, the short like box. new fake ass woke Marvel comics. <laughs> <laughs> Look at y'all. You know, the short box nation is strong and mighty. And and um and that's something, man, that like regardless of what happens, it's like as long as I've taken the time to plant those seeds and really um, kind of foster that relationship, like, yo, it, it don't matter if there's a, a, a pandemic or if I got to stay home and I can't see someone. Like, I know that, you know, that that can't easily be broken because I can't sell you something anymore in person, you know? Yeah. It's a great example of what you're talking about is the car companies, car insurance companies. Like, you saw how, like, a bunch of them have started saying, hey, you know, we've noticed, like, you haven't, been driving so we're not going to charge you your full rate Mm -hmm. you can see it with some of the gyms like hey we're close so we're not charging you and it kind of forces other companies to either do the same or be remembered for not doing anything of the like when times were bad yeah and then also puts the weight on what happens is when things get better and and don't get me wrong it's gonna be a a long ass time before things really get better back to yeah i don't think they'll ever truly go back to how they were um this is one of those moments in time where there's a shift and a change. Well said. Agreed. But uh, afterwards, you'll remember, oh, I, w- I was with this car insurance company. And they didn't do shit for me. Fuck them. I'm not renewing. I'm going for those other guys. Or this is the company that tried to exploit me and my family mm-hmm. at the worst possible time. Fuck them. And then you're going to remember the other companies that we're trying to do things even amidst their own struggles, if not for you, the consumer, but for their employees. Like, um, who was it? Is it like Grumpy's? I want to say they're called like Daniel DeLeon. Mm-hmm. I forget. He's like, he opened a pita pit way back in the day in Fleming Island. And uh, he was a super nice guy then. And then he went out to open this restaurant like Grumpy's or something like that. Um, local guy but here in Jacksonville. He's taking a pay cut. Well, he's not getting paid, so he can pay his employees. Yeah, and that's that's freaking that's, yeah, that's strong. Awesome. That's tough to do. Um, I, I keep seeing stories like that of people making sacrifice. Those who have sacrificing to help those who do not have. And I think that's one of those things that we need to do more than ever now. And um, that's what's more important to me is that we just get through it and then we take care of each other. Yeah. Like the events and everything else, I realize people's need for connection and mm-hmm. I'm aware of anxiety and mental health and depression and things of that. And so we're going to do what we can to help with those because those are the things we can do. Those are the things we can help with. In terms of, okay, well, what are we? So when August comes, how many tickets do you think we can sell, huh? <laughs> You know, fuck that. Like that's yeah. it's low on the Google's priorities. trying to tell talk to me in the background. Yeah. Um that's not important. It doesn't need to be important for GAM. Um like I said, almost all GAM has like their own day job anyways. Uh what it, it would suck if GAM was gone, but that's not gonna be the case. I'll just say, all right, when things get better, that's when we'll kind of sort of go back to how things were, but we'll definitely have to make lots of change. Like all the digital stuff we're doing now and how we're trying to plan things out. Um, we were ready in transition plans for gladiators to try to expand that into here's kind of like normal real world gladiators versus here's kind of more digital gladiators. But I mean, that it's, kind it's, of stuff. And, and I'm glad you brought up game gladiators because you threw the first Game Gladiators last year, had really good success. Mm-hmm. It was kind of like what Game's first kind of foray into um, the competitive yep. uh, um, um, gaming. Competitive um, esports. Yeah, yeah, esports. Thank you. Um, mm-hmm. t- but th- I think that's the one component. And I know this year you wanted to make it you know, bigger and better, uh, continue on that trend in addition with the yeah. game shows. <laughs> but but when, I, when I look at the Game shows and then um, Game Gladiators, I imagine Gam Gladiators would be the the easiest transition to continue doing in a digital space. 
because I mean, most of esports, for the most part, I mean, you, you you play online anyways. I mean, is there any roadblocks or, or things I'm not thinking of that would keep Gam Gladiators from being successful? Other besides, you know, the, the social factor or whatnot. Yeah. So one of the biggest. So for the casual competitor, mm-hmm. like me or you the lag and things like that aren't that big an issue because we typically play for fun. But for those who are genuinely competing, compete for money and are extremely serious and committed to this and like their skill sets are being sharpened daily to then have to contest with, I would have beat that guy, but I didn't because of a connection being bad. Mm. That's a big deal. A lot of these games, I shouldn't say a lot, there's quite a few games that people like to compete at that don't have full built-in lobbies, like for set up for tournament structure. And they don't have spectator modes and things like that. Like, for example, I was going to try to put together a, and this is, again, one of those things of me failing online. I was going to, I wanted to set up a need for speed, kind of like online race. Because I was like, how badass would that be for, like, you know, the car heads and enthusiasts, people who actually like to race? To be able to get in like Need for Speed Underground or Heat or whatever whatever it is, and have like a late night Fast and Furious style race of like six to twenty people at a time or something like that. I'm like that would be freaking dope. You could stream that. People could watch it. It'd be exciting. It'd be fun. But they don't have a way for me to enable a spectator cam to like actually track and go back and forth between all the cars. So it's like, okay, whoever, someone actually needs to race and keep up with all the cars for us to have a camera to actually to show that off for other people to watch. Um, for, for, let's say, Street Fighter, if we're having something where, let's say, 100 people want to compete at Street Fighter, that means there needs to be X amount of stations set up, and especially during this time where we can't all be in the same place, the people are coordinated and either there's some kind of honor system in place or let's say I need, I don't know, six TOs all set up with their own individual station at their house that are then having people sign up and do friend requests to each individual TO. And then for people to watch it, each one of them need to have their own individual stream. And then all those streams need to pipe to like one main, like there's a whole, the logistics of it are so fucking horrible. <laughs> They're doable, but again, this is part of, it's almost forcing us to step forward into the future faster. This is probably where we were going to get to in four or five years. Now we need to get there in one to two. Hmm. Damn. Well, you got a it's full a point, plate. You got a full plate of, of things going on. Yeah, but, you know, keeps me <laughs> keeps me entertained. And honestly, these are things that, again, I feel like the community the community that I that I love and that gives me so much in terms of gives me inspiration, it gives me motivation. Like how do I it's like how you were saying it's a two way street. You know, I feed them and they feed me. And I think that's how the whole team is too. Like so many of the people I see on the GAM team are doing like their own things to help keep people motivated and also express themselves. Like Mark Pariani does his own kind of like feature friend thing where he's like just day in day out he's posting about other people and their art and the things that they do um leslie's drawing everything underneath the sun right now um i think was it jessica saracino i always butcher her last name she does like these cosplay storytelling things where people hit her up and she tells a story like dressed up as like a i'm just gonna say a princess i think if i say disney then the the channel gets flagged (laughs) but uh now, everyone was trying to do something because it's part of who you are. Yeah. So if you're just selling a product that it sucks, life is empty, especially right now. But if you're still connecting with those people who share those passions with you, at least it makes those days of isolation feel like they have a little bit more value. Yeah, it's definitely, if you got a hobby or a, or a side hustle, it's definitely the time to get it ramped up and, and, and alive and well. Especially if if you're strictly on a more um, digital channel, um, it's it's yeah. like the, it's it's like perfect timing for you to be putting out content and just uh, staying it's consistent. Like if you were doing a podcast, now would be a great time to be doing video. 
Like, I don't know, especially if it was about comic books <laughs> and things of that nature. <laughs> you know, the, the, the fans don't want to see my face. They just want to hear my, my voice. That's it. I, I got, no, but, I got know, a face for Ed'll be there. You can bring him on another camera and put his drawings up. All right, look, I, I want to um, smoke. I want to put a, a nice bow over all this gam stuff, and then kind of get into this um, video game talk. So, in your words, what can people expect from Gam? How can they get their uh, their their video game fix from uh, from the Gam fam? Uh, what would you recommend? What do you want people to be on the lookout for? Um, follow us on social media. You know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or I love Gam everywhere. Or you can follow me, Gam Ryan, on Twitter. Uh, but the main, the biggest thing you can do is just interact with us. Tell us what you want. Tell us what you don't like. Um, we're just people too. So anytime I get feedback, I try to digest it. Um, and that definitely impacts where things are going on in the future, especially the live streams. The live streams is probably the best. The live streams are the best way to get in contact with one of us. Hell, I bring people on the live stream just to talk. And um, I don't know. I think that's it. Just just talk to us. We're people. We listen to stuff. I get people pitching me ideas all the time. Some of them are bad. Some of them are good. So, so it's, uh, But they always help influence the future. So it sounds like at the moment, GAM show in August is TBD. And then yep. GAM Gladiators is TBD. Here, I'll give you the listing. Here's all the GAM TBD. Oh, or, is it TBD or TBA? I guess either. To be determined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah to be determined. GAM TBD list. GAM show. GAM nerd market. GAM gladiators. Retro GAM night. Uh, community <laughs> meetups. Uh, there was... Oh, y'all missed it. We did have a, a screening planned of... Final Fantasy Advent Children at oh the UNF God. Auditorium. We were renting out the whole theater. That shit didn't happen. So that's going to be <laughs> TBD. Um, Bikes and Booze, TBD. Like, there's a whole list. There's probably like 13, 14 TBDs just sitting there. But when things get better, they will return. And now there's going to be a whole host of other digital things for people to actually participate in and hopefully to help other companies you know survive better in the future like i think this is forcing us to do so many things how we had a wrestling match the other night and we had a leaderboard and video game rescue red hot looks all plastered around like a fake duval arena that we made so i mean stuff like that that's what happens in the face of adversity you have to be clever and adapt and new things get born so things will be good in the future. Just stay alive, stay healthy, so we can get to that point. Well said, dude. Well said. Um, what video games have you been playing? Because I have, I will tell you one thing about being stuck at home. I have no excuse for not playing, you know, um, starting the PS4. So I've been in like a <laughs> heavy video game. Um, uh, in the middle of the night, blast hearing that. Beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> at least it's not the um remember how like the classic uh the playstation one used to oh come that's down <laughs> the wind chimes <laughs> oh yeah oh. Oh, it, oh man if you got that red screen like the red smoke oh you would go shit what's going on i gotta reboot this uh let me see uh to share the games that i've been on i have a beat Shadow of the Colossus, because I decided I was like, "Yo, I oh pay, nice, I pay for I never beat that. I pay for PlayStation Plus, and I mm-hmm. I have never ever like downloaded any of the free games that it comes with. And um, just last month, I was like, "Yo, I'm paying for this because you know what? The payment hit, and I was like, sixty dollars. What the hell? Right. <laughs> so then, of course, Did like, I get hacked? what am I paying this money? Exactly. For? I was like, "Yo, let me get my money's worth." So Shadow of the Colossus was one of the free games I played that. Um, I bought Final Fantasy. I got up to the part where you're helping uh, Tifa um, sell mm-hmm. uh, wh- whatever the hell. Uh, th- that little, you got to help her make some money, is essentially. So I left okay. off at you're that. Past me. I haven't had time to get back on it. Dude, I will say this about that Final Fantasy game. Um, I mean, Final Fantasy VII, you know, we play, I played it as a younger, never beat it, which has always been one of my like. Uh, video oh, game man. shame, like one of my like video game kind of shame moments. You know, I've never told anyone uh-huh. I didn't beat Final Fantasy VII, um, because it was one of those like pops rented it. You know, Blockbuster only gave you like a week, 
And of course, we yeah. weren't beating fucking Final Fantasy VII in a week, so we had to Dude, return I it. Before over we my brother's game file, like I don't know how many times, <laughs> like the fight in the house. Yo, so. Um, so I definitely hopped on buying the remake, uh, and thank mm-hmm. God I did, dude. Have you looked at the uh, resale prices on it? Like it is hard as hell to find. Like GameStop don't got it. Uh, is it? Uh, last time I I was talking to Drew um earlier in the week because he was looking for it. Uh, prices on Amazon are they only got the reseller prices. I know on eBay it's a little pricey. I don't think GameStop has it in stock mm. as far as I know. So. I'm going to get back on Final Fantasy VII, and then uh, Warren, shout outs to Bar of Darkness, he convinced me to give PlayStation Now uh, like this seven day free trial. So I've been playing Rocket League like a mofo, man. <laughs> what about you? What, what Rocket League's you? fun. Rocket League's super fun. It that's is, one of the events, one of the games I like to have more. In it is just, and that's not like my, the type of games I gravitate towards. Like I just, they're not. They've never been in my rotation. I've always kind of been like the adventure RPG fighting game mm-hmm. type guy. But something about but that game. it's just dumb fun. Dude, it's, it's like, yo, here's how you drive forward. Here's how you reverse. Get this ball into this net and, like, you know, enjoy. That's it. It's Did really. The Back to the Future car? Not yet. Not yet. But uh, one thing about Rocket League is it is one of the only games I have ever tried to play online, which I stay away from online. I just. Oh, I, I'm man. not. In my opinion, I'm not good enough at any game to go online and play like, you know, a 12-year-old that has 40 hours to practice and shit, right? Yeah. But I went on Rocket League, and I was fucking MVP for a couple matches. Yeah. I'm like, what? What? Yeah, son. (laughs) Spring. Playing on that Somalia server? Like only three people in the village on the game? (laughs) Oh, you got me on that one. So what about you, man? What have you, like, what have you found time to play? Um, I played a little bit of Animal Crossing. Okay, which it was definitely fun, therapeutic. Um, but then I was like, I don't got time for this game. This this game is too big a time. So I, I started Final Fantasy VII. Uh, I'm gonna get back on that. And I've been playing actually a lot. Well, you've seen on the streams a lot of WWE, mm-hmm. 2K20, and uh, UFC Fight Nights. Um. Because I've been just like trying out all these different games now. Like I haven't been getting too far in most of them, but now I'm just like trying things left and right. Like I tried out Need for Speed the other night, and then I tried out um, Celeste, mm-hmm. which is really cool. It's like one of those old school pixel style games. Um, I was about to, I've been doing GTA mods on PC, <laughs> so I've been. Getting like Iron Man and shit flying around <laughs> for <laughs> yeah, Anthony Thomas yeah. Five. And uh God, there's something I'm debating picking up drug dealer simulator. What so wait, 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 wait. That sounds like the and, most uh, It's on Steam and apparently it's like kinda like Grand Theft Auto, except you get to pretend being a drug dealer and they have you <laughs> like getting hydroponics and they're like, Oh wait, you see a bunch of people sitting around. Maybe I'll stream this. You'll see people sitting around in like a park area and like, oh, is that the guy I'm supposed to make the drop off with? Oh, I think he might be a cop. I'm like, whoa, this is like this sounds like this a is like the Duval the game. This like, sounds, how did they This sounds like a game that like suburban kids would fucking love. Like I could be a drug dealer from the comfort of my home. <laughs> uh, but no, I'm just I'm trying out different stuff and I'm trying to find as many games that allow me to play with other people. Like Doom Eternal is freaking awesome. I actually got I think I'm pretty close to the end on that. Wait, are you saying Dune Eternal or Doom Eternal? Oh, Doom. Sorry, Doom. Oh, the the, the new, um, uh, the, the, the latest, it. the latest Doom, right? Yes. Yo, I think I, I think I, I know I saw it on PlayStation's um, Spring Sale, and I think I want to say it's on PlayStation Now, and I feel like that's a game that is probably just is easy. To, I've never played Doom for the Doom for the record, so. Oh, you should pick it up. Like you'll, yeah, you'll have fun. Okay. It is. Actually, I'll just lend you. I've got Doom 2016. They can, um, oh, that's the one that um I think C had championed a couple months ago. But um, it's awesome. Huh. Actually, some of these games you can share online. Yeah, like with PlayStation, you can just click like a button. And it's like if I have it, you can play it on your machine or yep. something game like share. that. Yep, yep, yep. I have to check that out. Um, I do want to say I've been um I also downloaded this game called Journey. Oh wow! Look at you getting super cultured. Yo, like you know, you know, it's funny. I, I downloaded that game, and immediately I was like, "This game is for hipsters who 
this is definitely a hipster <laughs> game. Like it's very artsy. Um, oh, yeah. There's no real, at least so far, uh, direction or story. It's just really pretty to look at, and it's very anticlimactic. I was like, this is the hipster that, fucking video. That's game. actually the perfect game during times of being in isolation. <laughs> it's like you're playing real life when you're playing Journey. It's like I'm the only motherfucker in this. Oh wait, I see somebody! Yay! It's yeah. It's I, I still haven't life. seen anyone. It's like you know, just screen, uh, endless screen of of desert and sand. So. Just um, whistling. And then immediately I said, man, yeah, fuck this game. And then I shifted to fucking Twisted Metal Black. <laughs> Twisted Metal Black is so damn good. Man, Mr. Grimm used to be Dude, my guy. It is so... <laughs> it is like the perfect edgelord. I went from like a very uh, um, video game snob selection in Journey and straight to like edgelord, you know, Twisted Metal Black. Yeah. Twisted Metal Black is refined. Not only do they have one of the best intro songs, do they still have the song or did licensing hit it? Do they uh, sing Paint of Black? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't think I paid attention. Oh, man. I just saw that Axel was still in the game. Who, who you know, I remember playing the original <laughs> Twisted Metal and Axel being, you know, the, the black dude tied up, you know, to two giant yep. wheels was like, whoa, the black dude is rad in this. <laughs> oh, you feel like this is a representation of real life. Man, he's <laughs> tied up. And I think he had like dad problems too or something like that. Yeah, something like that. I oh, don't actually, know. it was his dad that ended up putting him in the two. Um, uh, and, and his situation. God damn, brown dads. Hmm. I'll see. I'll if I can get that on. I think I have PS now on on this account. I'll play some Twisted Metal. Did they have a new Twisted Metal? Black was the best, but I'm trying to remember if they have one on PS4 or not. I'm not sure, but um, I, I, I think that's the only one I, I saw on there. But I'll tell you what else I've been really revisiting and and whatnot because i still got the ps3 and I've, i found like all the games i had digitally bought um and kind of brings it up to our, our last topic for uh today's show and that's the marvel versus i don't know how to put it in one bucket so i'll just say the marvel versus capcom series of franchise mm. i mean x-men versus God, street fighter marvel versus capcom well i used to marvel versus Please. capcom um i, I can't seem to I, I mean, of course, Children of the Atom is on here, but th- that whole Marvel and Capcom franchise series, I've been revisiting those lately. And it- it's mm. one of those franchises that whenever I do revisit, I go down a very deep rabbit hole because of its... It- it's like it-, it gives me my video game um, fix as well as my comic book fix because it has mm-hmm. some of the best artwork I, i've i've ever seen in any video game and i'd put it up against it any kind of comic so too. damn good like do you remember like yeah. what was your first conscious exposure to any of those uh, any of those games because for me it was the um x-men versus street fighter uh ad that they had in every single comic book from like the mid ni- from the uh, uh late 90s the the, the the fighter's edge you remember fighter's edge oh god fighter's edge <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I think uh, I remember because this is back in the time when I used to hit up like the tilts and Aladdin's castles. And I say tilts, not like an old man tilts, because there were multiple tilts um, all the freaking time. And I can't remember. And Putt Putt, they had Putt Putt and Mountasia. Yeah, the other two yeah, spots yeah. you could play these games at least here in Jacksonville. And I want to say it was Marvel Superheroes. Was it Marvel Superheroes or X-Men vs. Street Fighter that was first? I can't remember. So it was um, Children of the X-Men Children of the Atom. And then that shifted okay. into... Oh, you're right. You're right. I think it then went to Marvel Superheroes. And then X-Men vs. Street Fighter. But I, I could be wrong about the... I, I could look it up. No, I think you're right. Yeah. Because um, I remember seeing those games in the arcade. I remember when it was just like just the Marvel stuff. And I was like, oh, this looks really cool. And it was like the art style like pulled me in. Mm-hmm. And then... But I didn't really get completely sucked into it until it was Marvel versus Capcom. Mm-hmm. Like I love... I like Marvel superheroes. And I like maybe the reason I didn't like it as much as I would have because they tried using those damn gems. <laughs> Every Capcom game that has like gems in it is like got problems. Yeah, but uh, so just X Men uh, versus Street Fighter. Go so, ahead. So just to go ahead and um get, get the timing right, Marvel versus Marvel superheroes came out in '95, and I'm not sure if this okay. is the um um 
the arcade, I think it's the arcade release date, but 95, and then X-Men versus Street Fighter was 96, and then Marvel versus Capcom, and then 2, and so forth. Okay, yep, That's, that makes sense. Yeah, because each one of those, when it was just Marvel, and I was a huge, I mean, I still am, I'm a huge Marvel fan. Like like you, I grew up with Spider-Man and stupid shit, like Captain America turning into a werewolf and crap. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, it was cool to see the Marvel the Marvel heroes, which at this day and age is probably pretty much, pretty much just the Avengers. And uh, X Men was badass, but then when you actually had them all together, that was like Man. the draw. And it, and just the, the art style was just like from the the advertised art, like the concept art, yep, and then the in game art, even like the backgrounds. Everything was so stylized. Go ahead. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, no I, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking my head like in agreement. Like that, and especially for someone for me around that time, I was more into video games before I got into comic books. And I think it's safe to say for any other kids, you know, or people my age, you know, me being thirty, so definitely like you know, late nineties, early you know, two thousands, and so forth. Um, the cartoons, as well as I think. And I'd also yep. attribute these video games played a major role into making the foundation for my understanding of these characters. And then I got mm-hmm. into comic books and, and you know, really got the, the full scope. But between the, the, co- the cartoons, but and it's specifically these games, like... Wolverine was short. Yeah, right? <laughs> He's supposed to be. <laughs> like, that's where I learned, like, Omega Red, you know, Blackheart. Um, uh, oh, you God, know, yeah. Juggernaut. Well, who knows? Stuff. Uma Garoth. What? <laughs> yeah, I, I, to this day, I still don't know what the fuck he's, he comes from. But <laughs> actually, he's, he's a Doctor Strange villain. But even, like, Silver Samurai, you know, from um, oh, yeah. of the Adam. Silver Samurai. Was all, that Chinese star super would, like, chip, do so much chip damage. Yeah. Right. And, I, and, and I think for, you know, the previous generation... So like so like definitely someone like my dad and I was talking to, to Drew about this. They got to see these games and and compare it to the popularity of you know Jim Lee's X Men. Like I, mm-hmm. as someone who didn't get to live during that time and I wasn't in the shops buying you know comic books, I, I think I, I underestimate how big Jim or the '90s X Men era was and how popular oh Jim God. Lee was. It was- Huge. If you're into comics at all, and I haven't even even venture into outside of comics, you knew about Jim Lee's X Men. It wasn't Marvel's X Men. It was Jim Lee's X Men at the time. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. That's what we were saying. Was like everyone knew it by Jim Lee's X Men. But to to see them, and, and I mean, I think that was a big inspiration. Was Marvel was seeing like the success of Street Fighter wanted to leverage um uh you know jim lee's you know just x-men and period and specifically mm-hmm. jim lee's art style like it, it makes so much sense from a business perspective and then when you learn that some of these artists primarily um uh, bingus who also goes by um crmk and, and some other um pseudo names like gouda cheese that um you know him having really helped shape the street fighter concept art that jim lee's x-men was so huge that they went to him and said, hey, try to mimic his style because we need to make sure that the Western right. market um, hops on these games. No, like you could definitely see it was, it was a back and forth because I think a lot of these video game concept artists were so inspired by comic books. And this is almost like, it's almost like a dream job scenario. It's like, hey, growing up loving even at the time, you may not have grown up being a Jim Lee, um, I'd say fanboy, mm-hmm. but you're kind of coming up in the same period and you still have the love for the characters. And then you see this guy that makes artwork that's so inspirational. Like It's a peer at that point. You're like, oh, word, I get to draw kind of in this guy's style or at least draw doing the same characters that I love that Jim Lee's drawing or that what like. Tom McFarlane or Eric Larson. Like you can see so many influences during that period of time from like the East and, and West side. Like you're seeing kind of like this anime influence permeate within like Western art mm-hmm. when you're looking at like the, the X-Men versus Street Fighter and Marvel versus Capcom stuff. I'll say um, like Marvel versus Capcom 2, I think for the longest time, 
that was my um like default um i guess like character <laughs> design for for all of these characters like yep that artwork was was like the way cyclops is drawn that. that's how cyclops me should that's have always been yeah. <laughs> you know it wasn't until i got into comic books and i was like oh wait there's different art styles for the longest time all of that artwork in marvel's capcom 2 was like was the art for these characters this is what cable looks like this is what you know mm-hmm. ryu looks like and, and and whatnot and um and i and i'm sure it's, it's it can be said that it's left a huge impression on a lot of kids that weren't into the comic books man yeah like even I'll say even the way you would see like big burly guys drawn versus like, okay, this is what a, a, a lightweight kind of like small nimble guy will look like. Mm-hmm, like All right. This is what like a big powerhouse guy is going to look like. Like that's just, it became my, my standard. Yeah. And then when I look at other comic books, I'm like, why is Mark Bagley drawing everybody? Yeah. Stuff? <laughs> yeah. I think, I think the biggest disappointment for me when I was getting into comic books is that there wasn't a comic series with Bingus or Akiman or Shinkiro's art in the comic right? books. Like I could only see um, th- these, promotional images. Yeah, or the, the promotional. If I played the game, cabinets. which it, it gave me a big reason to like play those games as much as I could, because to me that art is is just perfect. Like it is the perfect amalgam of comic books and manga, in my opinion. Like this is yeah. what. You know, if a, if a manga was to do a comic book in the style of like Marvel, this is what it would look like. Um, I mean, it's just like the, the the characters were stylized. It was like exaggerated at times, but then like mm-hmm. you also had promotional art where it was like very well done, like very uh, almost photorealistic, um, like kind of paintings. Uh, but in game, yeah. they were still able to capture like the exaggeration of a comic book like they were like you know wolverine was short stocky like super fucking mm-hmm. muscular but then like you had spider-man like that that's the thing about bingus uh, who did a majority of the artwork was his range man like his spider-man was like very nimble swift like you know kind of mm-hmm. scrawny but still strong captain america was like you could just tell like he was like noble confident but like Heroic, a tank yeah. yeah i like how you mentioned the exaggerations because bingus and Akiman, all like their anatomy was on point, dude. Yeah, but they you could tell they knew when to exaggerate something like, well with said. a conscious yes. decision. Yeah. Like that's why Spider Man, when he's like part of it's like kind of extra elongated or stretched in a specific manner, mm-hmm. is to make you understand visually that this is a, a fast character. He's agile. Captain America, like you're saying, he has that certain kind of. His anatomy is on point, but they exaggerated at times, like how barrel chested he is, or just the way his chin, or like like a heroic rising of the fist coming towards the camera, just a little bit extra, or something like that. Like it was all purposeful. And and the rabbit hole that I got, you know, because for the longest time, Street Fighter Alpha Three, you know, I that is probably Ooh, my Alpha. favorite. That is by far. I mean, when I think my favorite video games ever, it's it's definitely top five. But a majority of it is because I'm of still the- predicting next Street Fighter will be an Alpha game. You think so? That's my prediction. Well, I, I have to smart. They just they need to go back to Alpha. At this point. Well, I guess at this point, what would be the difference between dropping an Alpha game versus a regular one? Art style. Ooh, if they if they went back to like straight 2D, I'm not, I don't. I do not care. I know that people are like, yo, they're not going to go back to a t- 2D, man. Like, we're well too ahead. Like, I don't care. I want a 2D. I don't care if it looks mm-hmm. a little dated. I'm will... just fighter, but animated and looking in the style yeah. of like, Dragon Ball fighters, you know, like super anime style 2D. Uh, man, it's just, and, and, and I don't think a lot of people pay attention. And, you know, I, I definitely might be just be sig- sticking out my ass, but I don't think that. Because it took me a long time to find out the names of these artists. It was just, I would just tell people, oh, my favorite art is just mm-hmm. the art from these video games. It wasn't until like Capcom started releasing these art books that gave credit to, you know, Acumen and, and Bingus and, and, and a, bunch of, a bunch more that I got to put names to the faces. And it sucks that, um, <clears throat> like, to this day, I still want a comic book with just this art because it just plays such a right, big... I'd buy it. I don't care what the story is. Like, do you remember looking at, like, Marvel vs. Capcom, like, that cover, that PlayStation cover, and seeing All fucking the time. Spider-Man I, like, and Ryu remember, on one cover? You just look at the case. If I saw that case in, like, a Blockbuster or <laughs> Electronic Boutique, I was like, let me go see. I already own this game, but I just want to look at this again. 
at, like it's just this is very rudimentary and and very basic when it comes to a description but those games are just cool like i can't describe it any more than just mm-hmm. they were just cool they were sleek they combined two franchises that like that shouldn't have worked but they ended up working so well mm-hmm. um the fighting i mean just think about the gameplay it was so flashy it was like you know, lights and, 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 you know, explosions, like the screen would just go the hypersonic colors, mm-hmm. um, the, the air combos. It was, and I think it, it was at a time where you could take risks, I think is what really it boiled down to. Because, you know, Marvel licensing was much cheaper back then. This is like oh, during yeah. the pre Disney days. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's also one of the reasons that we ended up with like, you know, Spider-Man going to Sony and then Fox mm-hmm. getting X-Men. All, like you could get your Marvel license on the cheap. Um, and so I think people were like, Hey, I mean, that, that's not, Marvel versus Capcom. The whole thing was, you know what? We've got all these others. We got all these sprites already made. I just want to make a game, put everybody in it. We don't have to do that much work. Hell yeah. Let's do that. Easy approval. Let's go. Let's make this game. So I think the same, similarly with the art, like, I think if you were to make it now, you would have so much of, so many fingerprints of, like, other people on top of what the artist is trying to do. Mm-hmm. And I think we saw some of that with Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Yeah, yeah. Where, you know, we literally had, oh, here's the Marvel Cinematic Universe style applied to all these characters to make sure that there was a tie-in to the MCU and... I got, it was just like, oh, oh wait, we don't have X Men. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? How do you have a Marvel vs. Capcom game without X Men? Yeah. Uh, it, same thing I think happens from an art process as well. So many people are then looking over the art style and oh, here are the guidelines. They need to be like this, this, and this. Um, to me, the, those are early, those earlier ones, you know, Marvel superheroes versus Street Fighter and and uh, X Men versus uh, you know Marvel vs. Capcom. All of those earlier ones, they perfectly embody like. If you were to take a comic book and make it into a video game, this is what it would like. I can't think of any mm-hmm. other game that has done that that well, other than these fighting games, because no. you know that is the spirit of a comic book. Like exaggerated yep. characters, like very colorful, like uh, the biggest, weirdest, like kind of blast and combos, and the fact that they gave a lot of these. Uh, how about this? They gave a lot of these attacks names. And for me, the longest time, that's what made comic books super cool. <laughs> Optic was like, Blast. Yo, so Optic like, Blast, <laughs> Berserker Barrage. Um, uh, uh-huh. uh, what was uh, Cyclops' other one? Was it like Gene Strike or something like that? Oh, Beam Strike? Yeah, it was something like that. Gene Strike. But um, like... <laughs> yeah, you're a Berserker Barrage, Berserker Barrage. <laughs> Yeah, man. Uh, I've, I've just been kind of like fanboying out over all of these classics, um, to, primarily just because the artwork has left, like to this day, has still left an impression. And I think it's safe to say when I think about like my top five favorite comic book illustrators, Bingus is is up there just because his artwork is still so heavily ingrained in my mind and, and, and childhood. And mm-hmm. even to this day, like I just compare, like I still want more of his artwork. I look at his art and I'm instantly transport is like being a kid seeing the uh, promotional artwork or seeing the arcades and just being like fucking mind blown that my mm-hmm. two favorite franchises at the time had came together you keep checking every now and then to see like, has he made anything new yeah it, well, i found out that he was on, I, I read somewhere that he was on twitter so i immediately go on twitter trying to find him of course i can't but then i find all these like twitter threads um and, and it's still the same issue where it's People sharing his images from Marvel vs. Capcom 2 or any of the other games he's done, and mm-hmm. th- they still don't know who done it. You know, they're like, man, this is to me th- some of the best, you know, this is the best drawn Doctor Doom. Um, and I've seen that a lot where people will share his artwork from um, those concept art, and they're saying, like, this was Venom to me. He draws the best Wolverine. He draws yep. the best. Oh, his Venom was outstanding. Dude, it was like, the, it was like, he took Todd McFarlane's Venom and he just. Mm-hmm. I don't know. He, he just kind of like cleaned it up a little. Like Todd McFarlane yeah. was was edgy. He was like the definition of cool. But something mm-hmm. about the way Bingus translated all of his translations are just to me. He just found like the perfect amount of 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 uh, um, respect to the source as well as mm-hmm. making it his own and making it like manga and cool. You know, for video games. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I, I was still finding through all these Twitter threads, like people sharing his images, like, man, this was this was Doctor Doom to me. This is how Ryu is supposed to be drawn. This is how Captain America looks to me. 
and they just didn't know to credit like Bingus. Um, and I think that says something about the the um, ensemble of of Capcom artists was. I don't think they were about the individual credit because I mean to this day we're still finding yeah. out. I think they're just now getting popularized, but to be a part of Capcom at the time, it was like no, we're doing this as you know, uh, as for, a team. Yeah, as a team. This was Capcom's house style. You know, we're part of Capcom. I think it was just people who really sincerely and truly cared about what they were doing. Like, I don't think anybody or hardly anyone on that team was there because it was a job. It was there because they were like, oh, fuck yeah, we're working on this. And, you know, um, I started looking at... um, Because, I mean, like I said, the Capcom house style is... I could. I've bought so many of these damn Capcom art books, like these, uh, you know, Marvel's Capcom or the Street Fighter Eternal Challenge. Like, there was a period in the like mid two thousand tens where Capcom was releasing all these art books, and they had all the concept art from Street Fighter, Street Fighter Two, and and all of their games. And I used to just buy them and just spend weeks just staring at the artwork, never bothering to pick up a pencil myself, but just admiring <laughs> them. Um, and it just made me realize, like, yo, even the artwork in, like, SNK, King of Fighters, like, that stuff has, still has, like, left such a strong impression on me. And I think without Dude. without that, I don't know if I would have been into comic books as heavy as I am. I think those early video games really made me appreciate illustration and, and, and artwork. And then when I got into comic books, you know, the comic books took care of the rest by, you know, the story aspect and, and uh, shared universes and things like that. So when you talk about like the SNK and King of Fighters stuff, there was a guy, uh, Falcoon. Mm-hmm. And I used to emulate his art style so hard, even when I would do like um, kind of like freelance jobs and whatnot. If it was something for, hey, this is for like a swimsuit or a guy doing this or that. I'm like, all right, how would Falcoon draw it? Hmm. And, like, his artwork, ah, oh God, I got to find some of that. Falcoon stuff, some of it is not <laughs> safe for work. But um, hold on, I'm going to send you this real quick. Okay. Yeah, I, and you'll see it, and you'll be like, oh, man, I recognize so many of these guys. Uh, I'll chime in and, and say um, that, oh, my God. Yeah, I'm looking at all these pictures you're sending. And um, Yeah, that, SNK one is, is Falcon. You'll see it at the bottom. Well, I remember being in middle school. It was like the must have been. It must have been like the sixth grade. It was like the sixth or seventh grade. And I had and I used to carry around the Street Fighter Alpha Three um, Brady official guidebook with me everywhere. It was Brady, right? Was that the the the, the name of the company? Probably that- Brady made everything. Yeah, they did. But I used to carry around this Brady official guide Street Fighter book, and I used to draw every single like just i used to just co- uh, like copy of ryu's artwork um because that, that was all awesome. bingus too but, <laughs> and i remember this kid I, I remember this kid named alfonso looked at my me drawing ryu and he was like you'll never be a manga artist like clearly like you you don't know how to draw eyebrows and all of that stuff but that book to me was like it, it was more than just a strategy guide it was like my art book yeah I um I remember redrawing Ryu versus Fei Long in a Super Street Fighter Two style, mm. like with, and with all the weird anatomy and faces that go with it. And I'm I look back at it and I'm like, oh man, this thing was weird as shit. And I'm like, oh wait, that was the art style for for that game. And it was, again, it was like these artists were it was, they were our McFarlands, they were our Jim Lees, they were our. our but we just didn't know their names back well then. Said. We just knew Capcom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely think by the time I learned about the Lees, the McFar, like all the prime 90s uh, um, artists that directly influenced all of my favorite Capcom things, it was just it just made sense why I liked Jim Lee so much and et cetera. Because it's like, well, you were getting like, you know, uh, Capcom's homage to all these artists, uh, mm-hmm. you know, way early. Yo, I didn't, and I didn't know that, um, I guess... It was an X Men versus Street Fighter where Capcom introduced the um, the tag out feature, like the the, the two player yeah. at a time mm-hmm. tag out, as well as the super combo or something like the, like the the ultra combo. Yeah, the the three button super where it's like everything going crazy. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I think I got to credit Marvel's Capcom too for introducing me to um, 
to Cable. I mean, because I hadn't read the comic book. Oh, my God. Cable was so, so freaking badass. cheap. He so, oh, dude, come on. Oh, man. <laughs> Time grenade. Time grenade. Was, that photon gun I, whoosh, taking up the whole screen. It was so fast. I think my my team up, my lineup was always, damn, and I was definitely a little cheating ass boy. Cable, <laughs> Mega Man, and Iron Man. Like, if I knew I couldn't beat you and I just needed, like, to go to my A squad, it was those mm-hmm. three. Primarily because if you hit, like, the, the, the super for all three of them, it was, like, oh, laser yeah. light show galore. It was, like, the whole screen was filled out with <laughs> laser beam. <laughs> and then um, my, my brother Ellis used to play with Iceman, and I would um, go to sleep already. haunted by the fucking ice beam yeah ice beam i well that's why you had to pick iron man yeah because i couldn't um, get close to you i couldn't get close to you like nope not only that like almost i can't remember if it was iron man or war machine one of them was one of the few characters that could actually get chip damage on ice man so Hmm. like you could do like a a fireball ice man he's not going to take any chip damage but if you did like whatever the super was where like Iron Man or War Machine would shoot all the missiles, those would count as chip damage and keep taking his health away. Because we used to have those late night fights, and like my one buddy Andy, he would just pick Iceman. He would just sit there and ice beam all day and just block everything. And you're like, well, fuck that. I'm going to throw your ass or shoot these damn missiles at you. And <laughs> it was that, man, we could do Marvel's Capcom 2 all day. Yeah. That game was. Um, I- I think I got one more. I got one more thing to add. I, because at around the same time that Marvel vs. Capcom one came out, I know I was definitely in middle school, and when because the the main villain for Marvel vs. Capcom was Onslaught, and I'll never forget how freaking cool I thought Onslaught was. And then when my dad explained, I hated Onslaught. Like yeah, with Onslaught. Yes, the comic book series is very convoluted. It is not the best, but it is so prime. It's so stupid. It is so prime '90s comic book crossovers that to, <laughs> it's, it's got a special place in my heart. Like it was one of the biggest. Like Marvel's Capcom helped me get into. It made me want to read Onslaught, and then from there, I just got into comic books. Um, I'm surprised you still got into comic books after yo, reading about <laughs> that. Was, yo, it was Magneto and Charles Xavier fusion dance. I know. What? <laughs> Uh, are we gonna have like Gambox? Is that uh, how we unite? Wait, say it again. So we'll have Gambox, and that'll be our Charles and Xavier. Oh my God, yo! <laughs> I feel like Gambox is, Gam. is, should have been in the makings a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, yo, I think we are at a. I think this is a perfect spot to wrap up this episode um, because me and you have a Marvel versus Capcom ass whooping to dish out. And I think I'm on the receiving end of that. Um, uh, we'll see. We're and both yo, rusty. And you gotta, you gotta get me up on this Mujin stuff. Do you know how long? Yeah, uh, man. Yo, the fact that you still play Mujin is why, <laughs> like, at, at the end of the day, I cannot, you know, this is why I love you, man. Like, man, <laughs> you are still, like, you channel the shit that I loved when I first got into video games. And Mujin was one of those things that um, through middle school and high school that I had heard about and I had seen mm-hmm. kids play. And I'll never forget, like, when my buddy um, Wayne, when we were all living in the neighborhood as kids, had bought, you know, he was one of the first ones to have a computer. And when he learned how to download Mujin, and I saw, like, oh. fucking y- y- characters on that game that I had never seen, I was like, wait, is that Goku? And you've got Captain <laughs> America? What? Is that Homer Simpson? Yeah. Homer Simpson. <laughs> now, granted, some Mujins are absolutely ridiculous. Where there's like a thousand, you know, sprites in in, in one yeah. game, and you're like, wait, what is a Cartman from South Park doing up against <laughs> Spider Man? But uh, real quick, I'll say this one last thing about kind of the impact and legacy about all of those uh, Capcom Marvel franchise games is that. The fact that they inspired something like Mugen, you know, this bootleg video game mm-hmm. system that you could download the sprites from these um, um, uh, from these official games. Like, the yeah. fact that those are pretty standard go-to sprites for all of these Mugen custom games. Yes, um, they are the standard. That's like, amazing. And, and that's all, you know, uh, that is Bingus's original 
artwork translated digitized for the video games and that you know they're still being used to this day like i don't see a lot of bootleg mujin games using you know um uh, marvel versus capcom 3 graphics or or sprites no. from other uh marvel franchise games it's like no they like, tried to emulate this style that was set forth during the earlier era because it was so iconic and it had so much style it was so well done yeah that's well what that's what we all try to <laughs> Let's set our bar at for awesomeness. Like, nah, it's got to look like this if it's going to be good. All right, well, look, uh, let's go and wrap this up. Let's hop on these sticks. We'll, we'll do a, a gam a live stream, um, and I'm sure by the time this episode comes out, people can just find the video of me getting absolutely humiliated <laughs> online. <laughs> uh, but man, do you want to do? Um, do you want to give uh, another round of shameless plugs for anything gam related? Where can people go for more gam information? How can they keep up with what you guys got going on in, in, in uh, present day and in the near future? Yeah, um, I was gonna instead of plugging us, let's just I want to plug um, one the Volan Stars because they've been tremendous during this. Like they really have. I've seen them all venture off to do their own things and things to support and help others which is tremendous and i want to shout out to uh like leaderboard darby's dungeon mythical mountain gotham city limits um rec room jacks carve all those like local small business any small business especially within our community that's trying to get by you know look for them on facebook's on facebook instagram twitter whatever it is and keep looking for ways. Don't forget about them. Don't forget about them during this time when you're locked up. Remember that they're still out there. They still need your help. And uh, my bad to anybody whose name I've forgotten. But uh, that's no, it. That's I, all I got. I think you covered it, man. And well said. Dude. And, dude, thank you so much for hopping on the call, dude, and just kind of fanboying out and talking about all the all the things going on for GAM as well as um, the, the video game kind of being our uh, video game correspondent like you always are. Dude, no, it's a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And I want to thank the listeners for tuning in this week. Feel free to chime in and let me know your thoughts on the Marvel vs. Capcom franchise and what it means to you by shooting us an email at the shortboxjacks at gmail.com or leaving us a short voicemail to play in our next episode by calling 904 580 4095. Speaking of the next episode, we will be recording a part two to our Shortbox Hotline episode. So we'll be inviting some of our friends and Patreon members to call into the Shortbox Hotline and chat with us to champion the comics, games, books, and projects that have been keeping everyone busy so far. So if you're interested in participating in next week's episode, consider becoming a Shortbox patron. Visit patreon.com slash the Shortbox for more information on how you can become a Shortbox patron and help us keep the lights on here at the Shortbox studio. We've got a library of over 25 bonus and unreleased episodes as well as exclusive merchandise waiting for you in the meantime make sure to follow us on social media at the short box jack to stay up to date with our latest offerings and more thank you for your time as always best of luck out there short box nation stay safe stay healthy and tune in again next week yo what happened to peace 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 peace, peace.